I'm going to talk today about aging eyes. So what will we be covering today? We're going to talk about first basic eye anatomy. It helps to, um, before we talk about eye problems that are associated with aging, to have a basic understanding of, of the eye and how it's, how it's built. And then we'll move on to talk about the, uh, the biggies that we see that are associated with, with aging. Uh, cataract being number one, glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration, and uh, diabetic retinopathy, uh, really a w wider uh, uh, age spectrum there, but we'll, we'll include that as well. And then finally, we'll end with some good information, uh, answers to some common eye-related questions, tips to maximize your eye health. So things that I think, hopefully some of you will find um, interesting and, and helpful. So eye anatomy first. The eye is, at, at first blush, it, it doesn't look like there's much to it. And you think, what, how, how complicated could this little structure be? And the, the answer is really extremely complicated, when you, depending on what uh, level of detail you want to drill down to. But most generally, when we're looking at somebody's eye, you're seeing a few things, right? You see that the white of the eye, the white part is called the sclera. The conjunctiva overlies the sclera, so if somebody has conjunctivitis, that's inflammation of that part of the eye overlying the, the clear, the uh, white sclera. The colored part of the eye is the iris. Inheritance of eye color is a lot more complicated than I, I think people thought, used to think it, it was. Uh, a lot of genes involved there. Uh, the pupil is the central part, the, sort of the window into the back part of the eye. And you can see in the schematic in the lower uh, part of the screen there, that's a, a cross-section of an eye. So front to back of the eye, the cornea is the clear front part of the eye. It's kind of like the watch crystal of the eye, if you will. Going back from there, straight back through the pupil, you get to the lens, which has sort of a, an, it's kind of shaped like an M&M candy, lenticular shape. And that's what becomes cloudy with age, which is what a cataract is. Going back behind the lens, this, that big sort of orangey part, that's all hollow, empty space. Well, it's not empty exactly. It's filled with uh, vitreous gel, a clear substance, but it's, it's, the eye is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a, a hollow structure. And the back part of the eye, that orange, pretty orange, pink color there, that, the back part of the eye is lined mostly with the retina. You can think of the retina as a really delicate wallpaper inside a room wallpaper that you don't want to come off the wall and that's the delicate light sensing tissue inside the eye sends the signal it senses the light is stimulated by light and then sends that signal via the optic nerve to your brain where your brain processes that all those signals and puts it all together into what what you perceive what you see so here's another way of looking at it this is actually showing um, uh, the eye within the the orbit the bony orbit of the skull so the orbit you can think of it's sort of a pear shape hollow in the uh, in in your skull most people have two and the eye sits within that that bony orbit it's surrounded or cushioned by the yellow stuff which is orbital fat we all have a little bit of fat surrounding our eyes to cushion it and protect our eyes those long red lines there are bands, those are eye muscles attached to your eye and they're like a series of pulleys that move your eyes in a very coordinated way and the two eyes have to move together in the way that they connect to your brain stem that all happens in a, for most people in a seamless way that we don't even think about. So that's again just demonstrating where the eye sits in the orbit with the optic nerve extending back and going as I said before to, to the brain. This is, when we look into the eye, in the office, when we're examining somebody's eyes, we're looking at the retina, or another term is the, the fundus, when we, an older term, when we look into the back of the eye. And we see this pretty, pretty picture, um, this pretty view with this, again, this healthy orange pink kind of color, and the, these fine retinal blood vessels. This is uh, the, one of the unique things about the eye is we can directly visualize these blood vessels, and those in some cases can indicate disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, which we'll talk about. So it's a way of directly visualizing problems with the general health. You see uh, uh, the writing's very small there, but that white yellow circle there, that's the optic disc. That's the end of the optic nerve where you, 
uh, it basically inserts into the eye or terminates in the eye. So that's the start of that cable that, that goes to the brain. We're looking at, a, the, looking at it end on and um, one of the things we, we examine when we look in the eye. This central part here, so when you're looking at an object, this central part of the retina here was called the macula just like macular degeneration, which we'll talk about. And the very center part of the macula is the fovea. So, um, what, is, what does the real thing look like? Here's a really remarkable view of, it's a wide field fundus photo. This is a real eye, and it's like another planet. And the first time you look at, see this as a, as a medical student, it's really this amazing thing where you, find, where you actually see it, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a memorable moment. moment. It's, 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 it's really pretty, I think. Um, maybe that's why I went into ophthalmology. Uh, but this, again, going back to the other picture we had, this is the central part. This is a left eye, and this is the macula here. This sort of darker area here is the, the, the fovea, right in the middle there, actually, the fovea. And then this is just demonstrating how, how far out it goes. It's, the, it's laying everything out flat. And we're still not seeing quite everything. There's probably another 10 to 20 percent of the retina that goes way out that we're not quite seeing. But this is, that's most of it. Any questions about anatomy? Okay. So let's shift gears now that we have a basic understanding of the anatomy and talk about um, uh, some epidemiology here and eye diseases. So this is a, a slide that came from National Eye Institute which is a division of the National in, uh, Institutes of Health, NIH. And uh, this data is a few years old, but it, it, it is still, the, the, uh, in terms of the, the proportion of disease, it's still pretty accurate. And the question at the top, how many Americans over 40 have an age-related eye disease? So the answer is a whole lot. Cataract, as you can see, is disproportionately on this pie chart, is disproportionately represented. So as of, 2013, again a few years ago now, there were close to 25 million people estimated uh, in the U.S. with cataract. And that number is ex uh, expected in the coming decades to, to double. Um, to put things in perspective, on a global scale, worldwide, we're, there, are, there are scores more with cataract the number of people worldwide who are blind from cataract, that is, who visual acuity is 2,400 or worse, that's certainly not legal to drive vision. That's, you could maybe barely see the big E on the letter chart that we use, or not even. That's something like 50 million people worldwide whose vision is, currently, whose vision is, is, uh, is, is affected um, to that degree by cataract. A treatable condition. So we'll talk about that first. You can see follow, uh, following cataract, a good chunk of the population has diabetic retinopathy, something like seven to eight million, with some degree of diabetic retinopathy, diabetic eye disease. And then comparatively less, but still a lot of folks, up uh, close to three million diagnosed with glaucoma, and around two million with age-related macular degeneration. So this is, again, these numbers just in the U.S. alone, that's a whole lot of people with these, with these conditions. What about detached retinas? Under what category does that go? Doesn't fall into any of these categories. That's a yeah, separate, separate, separate problem, and not necessarily uh, age-related either. Yeah. So we'll start with cataract first, and this is a an example of cataract. This is a pretty obvious example here. They're often not this obvious. But what you can see here, thinking back to our, our illustration before with the external view, so you remember the white part of the eye, the sclera, okay? And then the colored part of the eye, we're looking through the clear cornea to the colored part of the eye, the iris, and then looking within this dilated pupil, it's white, right? And it's white because the lens of the eye has become cloudy with age, um, with age. And so, um, Cataract, interestingly, so the, the word cataract comes from uh, the Greek. I want to say it's a cataractos was the, maybe Gus would know this, but yeah, anyway. 
um, the Greek cataractos, which means waterfall. And you can imagine looking at a, something like this, you could imagine rushing water as you're looking at a cataract like this. Again, we don't see cataracts, we'll sometimes see cataracts of this severity, but this starts, this is starting to get into the kind of thing you'd see more in the developing world, somebody presenting with a cataract of this severity because the vision will be quite poor. So, as I said before, this is the most, or alluded to before, this is the most common cause of blindness worldwide. Clouding of the natural lens, typically age-related, but can be due to other reasons as well. They can, there can be uh, medical conditions that, that can uh, predispose people to developing cataracts, some medications, mo uh, most notably steroids, uh, long-term steroid use. There are uh, kids who are born with cataracts, if uh, we call that congenital cataract when it's present from birth and uh, if those are identified and recognized early then uh, those those kids can have that treated at, we want to treat that at a young age and get those out as soon as possible S typical symptoms though in a older adult with an age-related cataract include things like blurry vision glare especially from headlights at night or uh, other going into a setting with bright overhead lighting difficulty seeing in low light settings this is a simulation of what I'm talking about. So here's from the, this is from the National Eye Institute website, and here's an, a picture of a, of a, of a acute scene with two, two boys, and, and it's labeled as normal vision. Well, what would a cataract do to this scene? And so this, this is a simulated view, of course, and this is probably a, a little bit farther along than, than when most folks would start to notice a problem. But you can see that overall the colors are a little bit washed out, and the scene is just blurrier overall. So what to do? Well, fortunately, we live in a day and age where we have a great solution for cataracts, and that's uh, cataract surgery. Get rid of the cataract. This is a scene from um, that might be familiar to some of you uh, at, at uh, Midcoast Hospital. This is our operating room, and that's me sitting at the table there uh, doing a, a procedure. And cataract surgery has become a, a very routine procedure. In fact, it's um, probably the most commonly done surgical procedure in the country now. There's something like four million of these done in the U.S. a year, and um, uh, and and a highly successful procedure. A very high. It enjoys a really high success rate. Um, it uh, a very low complication rate. Um, it is. Uh, been shown in, in, in numerous studies to be hugely beneficial as far as the, the cost benefit, uh, uh, the value to society. It's just, it's, a, it's a, a fantastic surgery. It's the reason why I and a, a lot of my colleagues went into ophthalmology in the first place, not just because of the pretty retina picture, but because you see a cataract surgery done and you see the person the day after the surgery and, uh, and how, how happy many of those folks are and it, it's it's uh, you think hey that's pretty cool I think I want to do that so this is a typical again a typical operating room scene we have a nurse anesthetist over on the side Brooke I told her I would mention her in the talk and then usually there's a usually there's a nurse up top who's who's handing me instruments and and then you're sitting uh, at, at the uh, uh, next to the the person doing the procedure which typically takes 10 12 minutes to do this is what we're implanting in the eye with cataract surgery. It's a lens replacement surgery. We take out the cloudy lens and we replace it with a, a clear, usually acrylic lens, and this on, resting on a finger to give you some idea of the scale that we're working in. You could see in that picture there, maybe if you might have noticed, I'm looking through a microscope. And that's because we're doing, we're doing everything under magnification. And we need magnification when we're working it with objects like that. So this is what gets implanted in the eye and then uh, and gives, is able to restore vision to people. This is a, a picture, this is the real thing. This was a picture I did of, of a surgery a few years ago, and this is sort of the typical uh, end of the, at the end of the case scene. The person's widely dilated, the lens is in the eye, looks great, well-centered, and so that's the nice, satisfying moment at the end there. Any questions about um, cataracts or cataract surgery? There's a lot of detail I didn't go into about it, but does LASIK um, affect that at all, like for cataract surgery later? Uh, LASIK. So where that comes into play, LASIK's a laser procedure. For people who don't know, it's a laser procedure done on the cornea, the front of the eye, to reshape the cornea 
to clear up the vision. So if somebody is very nearsighted or farsighted, you can do laser treatment to their cornea and reshape it and make their, that person's vision better. So where it comes into play with cataract surgery is that when we do our surgery, we take measurements on the eye and those measurements tell us what power lens to put in the eye. And those measurements can be a, a, a bit less accurate if somebody's had LASIK because their cornea isn't a normal curvature. Um, most of the time it goes fine, but the, the caveat I tell folks who have had LASIK or similar types of procedures previously is, hey, just so you know, it's just a little more, uh, uh, is a slightly increased risk that we might end up a little bit off the mark in terms of what, what your final vision is without glasses. Um, and there are ways of addressing that depending on how, how far off it is. So it doesn't by any means preclude being able to do surgery. It just makes the final result without glasses a little bit less predictable is all. Is that permanent when you remove a cataract? Is that permanent? Uh, no, it won't come back? Absolutely, yeah. So the lens is gone. Sayonara. It, does, it cannot regrow. This new lens goes in the eye and this is, a, as I said, in most cases it's, it's uh, made of acrylic. The acrylic doesn't break down with time, at least in our lifetimes or many lifetimes probably. Uh, so the, the lens is good. Some folks will get a little bit of a cloudy film behind the new lens in the eye that happens. It's like maybe 10 to 20 percent of cases after a few years. We'll get a little cloudy film which we can treat very easily with a laser procedure to clear things up again. Sorry, you had a question before. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions about that before we move on? Okay. Good. So we'll move on to glaucoma now. And this is a um, picture of an optic nerve here, a real picture. And, um, and what you're seeing with this optic nerve, you might be able to appreciate, it looks like somebody scooped it out, like with a melon baller. It's all scooped out. The blood vessels are coming out way at the edge of the optic nerve, okay? And it's all sort of excavated out here. We, th we call that, of this optic nerve, optic disc, we call that feature cupping. And it's a, it's a a hallmark feature of glaucoma. It's indicative of um, damage to the optic nerve and um, which, which accompanies glaucoma. Just by way of contrast, that's a, a picture of a, the color's a little bit different, the exposure is a little different, but that's a, a, a normal appearing optic nerve. This whitish area here is the typical size of the cup that we expect to see. This in this case may be about a third a quarter to a third of the total size of the cup. So you can see they're quite different on the, on the big picture. So what exactly is glaucoma? It's, it's, first of all, it's the second most common cause of blindness worldwide, we think. I, I told you in that earlier slide that there's something like two to three million individuals in the U.S. estimated to have the disease. Uh, and it's characterized by slow progressive damage to the optic nerve, as I said before. How does that happen? Well, it's usually associated with high eye pressure. The eye being a hollow structure, as we said at the outset, you think of the eye sort of like a basketball. This is one analogy I like to use in the office. And imagine that basketball being a little bit overinflated. Well, just as that's not good for the basketball, it's not good for your eye either. And what, in some folks, what that higher pressure can do is over time dam cause damage to that delicate optic nerve in the back of the eye. And that optic nerve is important, as we said before, because that's all the information from your retina gets sent through that optic nerve to your brain. So the optic nerve is really, it's really dense and pricey real estate. And if there's any damage to the optic nerve, then that's going to cause a, a, a significant problem with the vision. <clears throat> I said usually associated with high eye pressure because there are cases, there are individuals who have um, what appears to be glaucoma, probably is glaucoma, but a different variety of glaucoma where their eye pressure may be what we'd consider a normal pressure, but for some reason that normal pressure doesn't seem to be tolerated by the eye either, and they have the same kind of changes we saw there. Most affected individuals don't notice vision problems until the disease is quite advanced. Why is that? Well, that's because glaucoma, te whoop. oh shoot. I knew that was gonna happen. Okay, we're good. So, um, as long as this thing, okay. Um, no, I'm good, I'm good. I was just thinking, if it looks like I'm starting, to, if I'm like electric, starting to be electrocuted, somebody run up and push me away from, okay, um, no, we're good. 
Okay, so where I was going with the, oh, we're good, we're good. Thank you though, yeah, thanks. Okay, here's where we were, this is where I was going before, before that, that dramatic moment. So th what I was saying before is that most folks don't notice glaucoma until it's quite advanced. And the reason for that, swinging my arm up, the reason for that is that, that centrally, the vision is usually preserved until the disease is quite advanced. Folks with glaucoma tend to lose peripheral vision first. Okay, so you can imagine the vision, losing the vision out here, you're less likely to notice that until it's starting to encroach on the central part of the vision. You say, hey, something's not quite right here. And if you've gotten to that point, that's not a good state of affairs because there's already been, you've already lost all this stuff and it ain't coming back. So we like to identify the disease before it's gotten to that point. Of course, when it's still quite early on, then w when we can intervene. So. What can we do for glaucoma? Well, as I said, it's the only modifiable risk factor that we know of is eye pressure. And so we lower the eye pressure. That appears to, to uh, slow down the disease. In some cases, it stops it from progressing. So eye drops uh, are usually what's prescribed. There is a, there's laser treatment that can be done to lower the pressure as well, at least temporarily. Um, or in some cases, surgery is necessary to do that. And I also mentioned here regular eye exams to monitor for pro progression. There's testing that we do for folks with glaucoma to, to, of course, diagnose the disease, but then to monitor for progression. Periodically, we're doing these tests to see if the tests are getting worse, if they're staying about the same, if they are getting worse, is it just a little bit, is it a lot? And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it can be a challenging, condition to treat in some cases. Fortunately, in most cases, we're able to get it under control just with, with um, a medication. So, that's glaucoma. Any questions about that before I... Is that the eye pressure test, the, the puff of air? Correct. So that's one way to test the pressure is that there's a machine that can blow a puff of air at your face and, and at the eye. And, and um, um, there are other devices that lightly touch the eye. The eye is numb and we touch the eye lightly and can sense what the pressure is and that's what the reason why we like to measure that number. Make sure it's in a normal, when we're doing a routine eye exam, make sure that pressure is in a normal range and if it's not, then make sure there aren't any associated problems with that. Sorry, there was a question back there. Yeah? Can I understand you to say that the, once you've lost this vision, you don't get it back? Correct, yeah. So if you're undetected in an advanced stage, it's not going to get better. It's not going to get better, but we, they, the, we still want to keep it from getting worse, of course, and preserve whatever vision is still remaining. So, and I didn't, maybe I didn't, I didn't say that in enough detail before. The retina, the back part of the delicate wallpaper in the eye and the optic nerve, that's neural tissue. Those are neurons. And just like the brain, if there's damage to the neural tissue, um, it, the neural tissue does not, unfortunately, doesn't doesn't regrow. It would be akin to somebody having a stroke and then that part of the damaged part of the brain regrowing. Now we know with the brain, the big complex organ that it can, certain parts of the brain can take over some functions and, and um, but with the eye unfortunately once the damage is done it's done and that part of the optic nerve with treatment won't regrow over time. Other, yeah. Can you just go over the symptoms again of the early glaucoma? Early glaucoma, I would say none. Yeah, unfortunately, and so that's that's behooves so that why behooves us to have regular eye exams and and, and uh, periodic monitoring for it. But more advanced glaucoma, um, it wouldn't be such. I, I wouldn't say the case. Certainly, the cases I've seen that are advanced, it it's not so much. Hey, I, it's like tunnel vision here. It's more. Geez, my vision just isn't what it used to be. It's just everything, it's especially in dark settings, and it's like everything, somebody turned the gain down, and everything's just dimmer and unsatisfying un, uh, uh, with this eye. Everything, the color's less vibrant. It's that sort of, that sort of vague symptomatology. Yeah. Would that be on two eyes or just one? It can, the disease can be, uh, and I should say with any of these diseases we're talking about, they can be asymmetric. It can be much more pronounced in one eye, a little more pronounced. Typically, the two eyes being built the same in most people, we tend to see um, similar disease in both eyes. But there are certainly cases that we see with, with uh, somebody might have glaucoma in just one eye and not the other eye. Just luck of the draw, I guess. Is it hereditary? 
Yeah, we'll talk about that at the end. There is certainly, the genetics are involved with any of these conditions. Um, just the, 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 the giveaway for the end there is that with the genetics, in most cases of glau uh, glaucoma, account for probably a small portion of the overall risk of the, getting the disease for most people. I'm wondering about the span between, that, you know, between eye exams being annual. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that at the end too. Yeah, I saved all the goods that's, uh, to make sure nobody left early. Okay. I'm sorry? Prevention, yeah, we'll also talk about that at the end. Very, for this, very little. What's the normal range for pressure? Yeah, so normal range for eye pressure, we measure eye pressure in millimeters of mercury, and for most of the population, it's somewhere between 10 and 21 millimeters of mercury. So, um, um, so if you hear somebody checks your pressure and they say, ah, good, 14, you have some context now. Um, there are a fair number of folks whose pressure may be a little bit higher than that in the 20s, and those, most of those people will not go on to develop glaucoma. But we know the higher the pressure, the higher the risk. If I see somebody with a pressure of 22, 23, eh, no big deal, and their optic nerve looks okay, no big deal. If I see somebody with a pressure of 30, 35, then that's where I'm getting, even if their optic nerve looks okay, I'm, I'm concerned that person is, if they don't have glaucoma now, that they're, they're probably going to have it in the not too distant future and we should maybe intervene now. That would be statting with eye drops? Correct, Typ typically, yeah. Or the laser, laser procedure I alluded to before. But this still works, all right. So um, age-related macular degeneration we'll move on to next, okay, and this is a, a, a biggie. And most people uh, know somebody who's, who's been affected by this being as prevalent as it is. This is a, a real fundus photo um, of a, somebody's right eye. And what we're seeing here, it's a little bit blurry, but what we're seeing here is, it, uh, again, the central part of the retina called the macula. You see a number, if you can appreciate this, a number of fuzzy whitish yellow uh, spots here. And th these are deposits in the, in the retina. These are called drusen. And that's a, a characteristic finding when we look in somebody's eye and we see a number of dr drusen and they're clustered in the central retina. That, that uh, it, um, is, a, is a feature of macular degeneration. Now, sometimes we'll see a few drusen just as a normal age-related finding. What are drusen? We think they're just, it's metabolic waste. It's sort of uh, accumulated with time. It's kind of like the trash building up at the curb. And a few drusen, not a big deal, but increasing amounts of, uh, a number of drusen over time, drusen seem to have a, a, a harmful effect on the retina itself. And, um, and there may be other processes at play that we don't fully appreciate. And the retina itself can start to uh, be damaged slowly over time. So macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness in older individuals in the US. Um, as I said before, it preferentially affects the part of the retina responsible for central vision, your macula. And there are two types of this disease, dry and wet. Um, the dry form of the disease is like what I showed you on the last slide. What can happen in some folks is that um, uh, some abnormal blood vessels can develop and bleed into the retina or under the retina, that delicate wallpaper, and um, uh, as a part of the disease process. And that in itself causes damage to the retina as well. Your retina has, has less reserve, so to speak, and, and uh, that can cause a fair amount of damage to the retina in a, in a short period of time. <clears throat> in terms of the statistics or the data on this, there are a couple of interesting things to keep in mind. Uh, one is that the, in terms of the prevalence of the disease, there seems to be this, um, this uh, uh, interesting phenomenon that uh, we see as folks get into their uh, mid to late 70s. For individuals in their 60s and early 70s, the, the prevalence of the disease is probably like uh, one, two percent of the population. And then as, as the population, as we see, uh, uh, as we follow a group of people, as they get into their mid to late 70s, we see the prevalence of the disease go like this. And by the time most folks or, the, or that group, I should say, is in their late 70s, something like 15% of that group will then have the disease. So, and it seems to be a pretty predictable uh, uh, event that happens. So keeping that in mind, that's when, while the disease can be diagnosed at a younger age, 
mid to late 70s is really where, where at least in my own mind, uh, where I, I expect to see the disease. And then it, it doesn't keep going up like that, just to reassure you, it, it's, it eventually it seems to plateau. And so maybe 15 to 20 percent of folks, 80 something year olds and even 90 something year olds. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, regarding the dry and the wet form of the disease. Something like 90% um, um, of individuals, 9 out of 10, will have the dry form of the disease. The dry form of the disease tends to be more indolent in nature. Think of a smoldering, smoldering embers in the fireplace, okay? It's that sort of thing. The process is, is happening. How fast or the, the, how hot they're those embers are, are burning is variable from person to person, but it tends to be a slow smolder is the way I, I like to think of it. And most folks who have the dry form of the disease will retain vision that's good enough to lead independent lives, to drive, to read, to see faces. One out of 10, or about 10%, will have the wet form of the disease, which tends to be more aggressive and can damage the vision uh, more, more quickly. Um, those, those uh, unfortunate individuals will have more advanced disease, whether it's dry or wet, um, because the disease affects the central retina, it could cause this sort, of, um, this sort of thing, where the central part of the picture, now with our, looking at this picture, this is of course is a, is a artificial representation because you can look around the picture yourself and say, well, I can see the hands okay and the ball okay. But if this was your field of view and the central part was your your central vision, what you're looking directly at, as you could imagine, that could be quite limiting. You're not legal to drive, you can't read. If you're looking at somebody as they're talking to you, you can't see their face. So it's, it's, th this is an unfortunate state of affairs. Fortunately, most folks with the disease won't get to this point, but um, we, do, we do see it from time to time. And back to your question about one versus both eyes, sometimes one eye may be like this, but the other one is still hanging in there and you're keeping your fingers crossed and hoping that it, it doesn't get worse. What can we do along those lines? Well, um, diet has been shown, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, to be um, a healthy diet may be protective in some ways. Regular exercise, no smoking. Smoking has been associated with uh, 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 getting the disease and worse, if you have it, worse disease, having worse disease. So these are things that make make good sense and that will be a theme that I'll finish up with is that things that are good for your general health are good for your eyes. Okay, For individuals with dry macular degeneration there's a vitamin supplement that's available that there's one of the few uh, 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 vitamin supplements that is truly solidly evidence-based to show show real benefit and, and the, the acronym is AREDS2, age-related eye disease study and these were studies that were done to show that for folks who have the dry form of the disease, uh, and it has to be at least what we call intermediate severity disease, um, and they take that supplement twice a day, it will decrease the risk of the disease getting worse. So that doesn't apply to everybody. Somebody who's got the early, just the early stages of the disease, there was no, no benefit observed. But for folks who have disease that's a little further advanced, we recommend they take that because it's the only thing we've got, short of the other lifestyle things we talked about and monitoring the vision closely. We give folks a grid like you see at the bottom of the slide there and we want them to call us if they notice it becoming distorted or any new missing spots in the vision, which would be indicative potentially of, new, of bleeding in the retina, dry to wet disease, okay? For the wet form of the disease, some of you may have heard of folks getting eye injections. It sounds horrible, doesn't it? it sounds like it's a form of torture. I, I, it's easy for me to say it's, it's, it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, I, 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 I do these injections regularly. It's, it's the, the needle that's used for these eye injections and they're done over on the side of the eye, an eye that's been completely anesthetized and is completely numb. We do it right in the office. And the needle is a tiny needle. It's about the size of a needle you'd give an insulin injection with. It's a 30 gauge needle, sometimes a 32 gauge needle. So it's a very small needle. Most folks, feel very little, if anything, with the injection, um, and, uh, and then go about their business. And the medication that's injected in the eye has been truly game-changing and vision-saving for a lot of people. This has been available now, these ty this type of medicine, for um, going on 10-plus uh, years, probably 10 to 15 years now. And um, 
and in what it can what the medicine does is in cases of wet macular degeneration it can stop the bleeding temporarily those leaky blood vessels it can sort of like patching a leaky garden hose but eventually the patch falls off and you need to re-inject okay so that's the unfortunately folks who are getting the injections they're more basically signed up for rest of their life injections not everybody some folks will get to a point of stability where there's no more leaking and things are good but for most people there's some they get the injections with some some regularity. Is Avastin you're talking about? So yeah, so Avastin, Avastin, there was a drug before Avastin that didn't work so well, but Avastin was really the first drug that was shown to be effective for this. The uh, Avastin, it's, it's actually uh, a chemotherapy drug, it's given for like colon cancer for example, and somebody based, just based, a scientist figured out based on how Avastin works, figured out that, that this might work in people and of course they tried it I think probably in some some uh, unfortunate lab animals first and then figured out it was safe and well tolerated and then tried it in people and found that it was really effective in individuals with macular degeneration so there are now three drugs on the market that are that are um, FDA approved Avastin is still used but it has to be obtained through a compounding pharmacy because it's not it's technically an off-label use of the drug so the other drugs have these great names. There's Lucentis, and there's Ilea, and then the newest one is BioView. And these are drugs that are injected, uh, as I said, into the eye, and, and they last for usually at least several weeks at a time. Um, and um, it's the best we've got right now. It's, and as I said before, it, it's a vast improvement over what was done prior to, it really prior to uh, the, this, that medication be avail being available, all we could do was either, if, uh, if somebody wanted to take, take their, their chances, is either aggressively laser the retina and try to uh, laser those leaking vessels, and in the process some of those folks would just end up losing their vision because of the <laughs> aggressive laser treatment, or you could do surgery to try to clear the blood out, and same thing, uh, half of the time it might, that just might precipitate what was going to be the end result anyway. Um, so really heroic, desperate heroic measures previously, um, which nowadays don't, don't need to be called upon nearly so often. Are those kind of injections covered by insurance? Yeah, so that's a, definitely a thorny issue. They're covered by insurance, but they are draining Medicare dry and other, some other insurers, I'm sure. Um, these drugs accounted for, it was, I don't know if this was last year's data or two years ago, 12% of the Medicare budget. It was something, two point something billion dollars spent on these drugs. So per dose, the, the typical cost per dose of these drugs is, is upwards of $2,000 per dose, right? Um, so uh, so we're, <laughs> whereas Avastin is $50 a dose. So why aren't we doing Avastin exclusively? Well, there are different reasons for that. It's not purely a, a dollars and cents issue. There are situations where the, the FDA approved product, the brand, the, the brand name product, FDA approved product, where uh, may be more effective for a given individual. There are other eye conditions I didn't mention that we use these injections in, in, in which those other drugs may be, may be uh, more effective as well. Um, for some people, Avastin is a perfectly good drug, and they could be getting Avastin, and there are surely people out there in the U.S. and in the world who are getting injections and not getting Avastin, they're getting one of the other drugs. There are also other political forces at play. It's a very thorny issue. The company that makes, not to, not to, to badmouth uh, Genentech, but Genentech, the company that makes Lucentis, also, uh, they have the misfortune to also make, uh, manufacture Avastin. And they, so they came out with Lucentis with the, with the much higher price tag. And there was some underhanded stuff going on. There was an article, I want to say, in the New York Times a number of years ago. And they got, they got uh, Genentech was dinged for this. They were, they were uh, sort of under the table incentivizing providers to use Lucentis instead of Avast. And so they got in trouble for that, and rightly so. Um, but uh, from a purely clinical standpoint there are situations where the more extensive expensive stuff is the more is the, uh, the uh, is the better um, treatment to use the cost aside um, 
There are also providers who feel strongly about uh, the uh, safety of using the more expensive FDA approved products that are coming directly from the manufacturers from facilities where they feel more confident that they're, not, they're going to get a safer product. There have been cases, very rare, but cases of um, Avastin from compounding pharmacies that were contaminated and, and then a cluster of individuals who end up getting eye infections, some having terrible outcomes. So that's, for, that's quite rare and again Avastin is widely used still uh, across this country and in other countries, but there are, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated, complicated issue. One that you wouldn't think should be as complicated as it is, but. Oh. Good. So we'll finish up with, um, in the last few minutes, with diabetic retinopathy, and then I'll get to the, 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 uh, the good stuff at the end. Um, so diabetic retinopathy here, this is a, 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 uh, another fundus photo, color fundus photo of somebody's right eye. And what you're seeing here, and it may be hard uh, 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 in this room, but some of you might be able to, to uh, see there's some red spots that weren't seen in the other pictures. These are hemorrhages. These are little, um, this is bleeding in the retina. So there and there and there, I'm trying to point out some of the bigger ones. There and there and there and there. And this whitish stuff here, thinking, what the heck is the whitest stuff? You know, that somebody gets that a fingerprint on the slide. And that's what these are, are exudates. These are hard exudates. And what that means is that there's been fluid, leakage of fluid into the retina here. And this is kind of like, think of this as maybe like a high water line that's left in a basement with some flooding. So this is indicative of swelling in the retina. So what this is telling us is that diabetes damages, it affects the blood vessels in the eye preferentially, just like the other parts of the body. We know it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a cardio, it's a form of cardiovascular disease really. So folks with uncontrolled diabetes will be at higher risk of nerve damage and kidney damage, strokes and heart attacks. And similarly, they'll be at higher risk of damage to the eye. It's a very vascular tissue. So diabetes uh, in, in Contrast to the other conditions we talked about, this is the leading cause of blindness in working age adults in the U.S. And that's working age defined uh, as age 20 to 74. So there's a wider spectrum of folks we see who have, of course, who have diabetes and who have retinopathy. As I said, it affects the retina primarily, but can also increase the risk of developing glaucoma and cataract. So these other conditions we talked about can be um, um, a, a, an end result of the diabetes, or, an, or a secondary result, I should say. And like glaucoma, diabetes may not be noticed until it's very advanced. So somebody with, with this sort of picture here, well in this case, this person will probably notice because of the swelling in the central retina, but sometimes we don't see that swelling in the central retina, and that person may have absolutely no visual symptoms. So when does diabetes start causing problems? Well, if there's swelling in the retina like you see there, or in some cases there are abnormal blood vessels that grow in other parts uh, th throughout the retina and that can bleed in the eye so someone will wake up one morning or in, during the day they'll notice suddenly a, like a, 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 um, a shower of floaters in the eye or like a sort of a snow globe thing that's bleeding in their eye. Um, folks with diabetes are more prone to retinal detachments. Those blood vessels can, can fibrose and scar down and pull the delicate wallpaper off of the inside wall of the eye. That's a tractional retinal detachment, and that is generally not going to, um, uh, going to uh, result in a bad visual outcome like this. So th what this is showing here is that the, the parts of the vision that are preserved aren't very good, and there are some parts that may be very severely damaged. So this isn't really, this is kind of a non-specific. This is just showing that diabetes has a much more uh, wider effect on the vision if it's, um, if it's advanced. So what to do about diabetes? Well, I think most of us in here know, most people know that diabetes is a, is a, a problem with regulation of blood sugar, blood glucose. So if we can control the blood sugar tightly, as well as other cardiovascular risk factors, high blood pressure, cholesterol, back to smoking, if we can keep those things under good control, then we can see changes in the eyes from diabetes go away um, and, uh, and 
Uh, we see many folks nowadays with improvements in management of diabetes. We see many folks with diabetes who have zero uh, evidence of diabetes inside. To look in their eyes, you wouldn't know that person has, has diabetes. That's become increasingly common. I mentioned injections there. That's sometimes um, used for swelling in the retina, the same kind of medicine we talked about before. Laser treatment can be more effective for diabetes than what I mentioned for macular degeneration. And surgery sometimes necessary as well to clear blood out of the eye if there's been a retinal detachment. So those are the those are advanced cases where that's necessary. So let's move on or finish up with some questions that that uh, some of you have already had. Um, first question: Should I take an eye vitamin? We're we're flooded with commercials and mailings about the, the benefits of vitamins and. Um, and as some of you may know, the vitamin and supplement industry is it's built on a, a rather shaky foundation. The, the quality of evidence supporting even a basic, taking a basic daily multivitamin is, is, is thin at best, okay? Um, I'm not telling you all to stop your daily multivitamin. You should talk to your primary care providers, but I'm letting you know that there's, there's very little evidence. If you look truly at the, sci the medical literature, there's very little evidence, I guess if any evidence, that that, that has, prolongs anybody's life, um, that that uh, greatly improves health. Um, similarly with, with uh, eye vitamins, you'll see some products that are formulated and marketed like I've, I'm picking on Bausch & Lohm Occuvite there. It's a multivitamin that has higher amounts of lutein and zeaxanthin and omega-3. And um, they have misleading ads talking, it, uh, saying that they'll improve your vision or protect you. You need to protect your vision. Start taking Occupite. There's, there's no good evidence for that. We know that those nutrients are found at higher levels in the retina. We know that folks who have macular degeneration of a certain severity can take a supplement with high levels of those nutrients and it actually seems to protect their eyes. But as I said before, folks who have early disease, or the studies also looked at folks who had, did not have macular degeneration, it did nothing to protect them from getting macular degeneration. So there you go. Um, so what about eating your carrots? Right. You got it. So healthy diet. Thank you. She was not a plant in the eye that was not staged. Um, so healthy diet, yes, we do have studies. Now these studies, these are big survey-based epidemiologic studies. They're inherently limited that way. You're asking people how much of this or that did you eat in the past week. But studies that have been done on, on, on big populations have found that diet, getting those nutrients through your diet seems to be the trick, okay? So the kind of nutrients we're talking about, and these are the same nutrients that are found in that AREDS supplement vitamins C and E, okay, lutein and zeaxanthin, zinc. I said question, uh oh, uh oh. Sorry, was that a dying gasp? Yeah, I'm sorry folks. I think that was the, um, that was the result of the, the, de the po delayed result of the, uh, fortunately I've got the talk right here so I can go off this off a, of, can you all see this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, hang on. As soon as this comes up, I'll, I'll finish up. I can do the rest. Just the, the, uh, there weren't the visuals like you had. We got through all the good visuals, fortunately. I'll be getting a, uh, I think, a, a bill from the IT department. Um, so diet, so I mentioned those nutrients. I said I was just where, I, where that, when it died there, I was just commenting on omega-3 fatty acids. So omega-3 fatty acids, such as are found in, um, in high amounts in, in oily fish, salmon, mackerel, sardines, um, some nuts like walnuts, uh, flaxseed, those are all good sources of omega-3 fatty acids. There's some conflicting evidence about um, um, omega-3 fatty acids and, and eye health. The original eye disease study for folks with macular degeneration found that uh, they included it in the supplement, but then the follow-up study, they didn't see any protective benefit. So again, it's, there's mixed evidence on that. Um, it's, there are folks who feel that we, with our Western diets, that we don't get enough of that in our diet anyway, and that there may be other 
uh, implications for our overall health that the omega-3 fatty acids may have some good anti-inflammatory properties, they may be good for our cardiovascular health and cholesterol and things like that. So it, they're generally thought to be got, thought to be good, but when it comes to the eyes, it's, it's the jury is still out, I would say. Um, the next item on that list was regular exercise, okay? So that may, regular exercise, the, the studies that have been done, looking at folks, again, survey-based studies found that folks who exercise regularly May, it may delay their cataract development. Everybody's going to get cataracts eventually, if that wasn't clear, everybody gets cataracts. But it may slow down cataract development to some extent. Um, interestingly, regular exercise may reduce the risk of developing glaucoma. Folks who exercise and then have their eye pressure measured, they, seem, they have lower eye pressure, transiently at least, after exercising. And then, um, so, so and, and these were folks who, who were doing just mild to moderate exercise, you're just walking qualified. Um, three or more days a week of exercise appears in at least one study to lower the risk of developing wet macular degeneration, okay? So it doesn't take much. Um, and these are things that are all found, or there's a, a, a possible benefit here, yeah. Yeah, I didn't see it on your list there in the, on the screen, yeah. but what about screen time? You know, you've seen a lot about that in yeah. seven or eight, ten years. You right. see an increase in screen time with right. younger people, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. So there's been a, a concern about that, and I can tell you there's no hard evidence that screen time is damaging to the eyes. Um, there's concern about blue light. Folks have probably heard of the concern about blue light. There was some study that came out a, a year or two ago talking about blue light, and b that it, blue light has not has not been convincingly shown. To, to be um, to increase the, the risk of developing macular degeneration or if you've got it of making it worse of precipitating cataracts or any other eye problems okay so bl and blue light seems to be uh, in things like this phone and in computers the light that's coming getting to your eye is there's a there's uh, a lot of bl blue light there and the concern more with blue light from my perspective is and there's good evidence for this is what it, it does for are being able to sleep at night and so a lot of the devices nowadays will have a little blue shift feature where it will cut out the blue light there are i've seen these ads as well and there are, there are optical shops that are that are trying to sell glasses that have you pay extra for for the blue light filter i would say at this point there's just no good evidence that that does a lick of good it sounds it sounds good but i wouldn't i would i would save my money okay um don't smoke was at the bottom of that list on that slide that that cut out there. So smoking again, it's just one of those things. It's kind of a no-brainer. We know it's terrible for your health. We know that it's never too late to quit. We know that folks even who think it's too late to quit, that within a very short period of time, we see a number of things improve in terms of the the uh, the levels of carbon monoxide in their blood and their lung pulmonary function and their blood flow. It's amazing within a short period of time from your last cigarette. We know that um, smoking potentiates, all these diseases I talked about here, smoking makes them worse. So, um, and there are, there are more resources out there now than ever as far as smoking cessation is concerned. There's the tobacco quit helpline. Um, talk to your primary care doc if anybody here smokes and if you've struggled with it. Um, I highly recommend, that's probably the most effective thing more than anything else I've talked about tonight that you can do. Program here too, be free. So, Perfect. Awesome program. Good. Good. Oh. A program here as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, I lived in Southern Oregon, the home of Pears. Yeah. And in the late 50s, early 60s, uh -huh. they had to use what they called smudge pots to keep the heat, to keep the fruit. Okay. Blossoms from freezing. Okay. okay. My eyes would just weep. And I'm just thinking in terms of people in general. Mm -hmm. Pollution, the environment, trying to keep everything clean. They no longer use that at Harry and David's for the for the pears. But yeah. Yeah. I just was thinking about how much I suffered at that time. Yeah. So it, with respect to eye health, obviously that's going to be very irritating to the eyes, um, right? Um, as far as 
you know, damage to the eyes themselves I, from you know, internally, I guess. It was probably more than anything, that's what you're describing was probably just more of a, sur a surface irritant, not to say that you'd want to be breathing in, or if you were in a, you know, a Shanghai or some a, a modern polluted city that you'd want to be breathing in the air um, there either. But with respect to eye health, I don't think it's probably not damaging like uh, smoking would be. So, um, uh, I'm glad they're not doing that anymore. The, um, so uh, the final final couple uh, questions here, or, or uh, fake questions I came up with. How often should I have my eyes examined? Okay, I think there was a question about that in the back. Um, so we do have guidelines. American Academy of Ophthalmology recommends um, a baseline exam in the absence of any other problems starting at age 40 and then from about 40 to 55 years of age every two to four years again in the absence of any issues and then 55 to 65 years of age every two to th every uh, I'm sorry one to three years and then from age 65 on we recommend a full eye exam every one to two years back to what I talked about before with especially like macular degeneration the older you get the more likely you are to have some of these conditions. It's still, the odds are still, to be clear, the odds are still greatly in your favor that you won't develop these things if you haven't developed them um, already, but we don't know in a lot of cases until we look. So that's why the guidelines are, are there to make sure there's not something going on that we want to catch earlier rather than later, okay? Um, finally, the final question, and this has to do with, the, I was asked about the genetics before. I have a family history of whatever. Does this mean I'm going to get it? Um, or what are my chances of getting it. So family history, especially in a first degree relative, okay, so a sibling, a parent, um, that may increase the likelihood of developing any, any given disease, but for the most part, we think this probably accounts, just like for a lot of diseases, for a relatively small part of the overall risk. I read somewhere, and I don't think anybody can say this with any definitive accuracy, but for glaucoma, I read somewhere that the genetic risk is probably like 10 to 20 percent for the general population. Now there are Occasionally, odd clusters, there are families that have some, there's some developmental abnormality of the eye and you see the parents have it and the kids have it and they've all got glaucoma and that's a very different situation. There may be, a, and there may be a single gene that they all carry that's implicated in that. But um, for run of the mill, a lot of diseases I should say that are probably multiple genes are involved, um, uh, uh, it's, it's probably a relatively small portion. So we don't change our screening guidelines based on that family history. We make note of it if somebody has a first degree relative, had a, a, a mom or a dad, or has a sibling who has macular degeneration. Take note of it, keep it in mind. If we start to see changes, we add, you know, that's part of the whole picture, but I won't, I won't uh, change how frequently I see that person just based on the history. I go by what, what I see in that person's eyes, okay? So routine genetic testing, which is available for conditions like macular degenera uh, degeneration, is not yet routinely recommended. We don't know what to do with that information. Somebody might have a high-risk gene. I don't know if that means they're going to get the disease. Maybe they've got some protective gene we don't know about. So the, it's out there, costs some money, it's neat information to have, but don't know really what to do with it and how it fits into our, our medical management at this point. So just to conclude, um, um, Thanks to advances in our understanding of, of all of these diseases and others that I didn't talk about and improving treatment options, visual impairment and aging need not always go hand in hand. That's a common refrain I hear when I see older individuals in the offices. Oh, my vision isn't what it used to be, but I'm getting older, right? That's just part of getting older. And it doesn't always need to be the case. There are things that are treatable. There are, we can intervene in some diseases and stop them from getting to that point. So that needn't always be the case. Um, I encourage everybody to get regular eye exams if you don't already have an established eye care provider that can be an ophthalmologist, that can be an optometrist. Let your provider know if you're having any problems, most importantly. The, um, I had a slide here to make a plug for an, a website called iSmart. There's a website called um, iSmart that's from the American Academy of Ophthalmology. The, the address is uh, www.getisMart.org and uh, G-E-T-E-Y-E-S-M-A-R-T, getismart.org. And that's a great um, information resource if you want to learn anything more about these conditions or other eye conditions, and they've got cool videos and, and illustrations and things like that.